Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth episode of Scaling from First Principles uh, series. The theme of uh, today's episode is uh, building products for scale. We have uh, three engineering leaders with us today, uh, Ajay Gore, Manjit Pahua, and uh, Puneet Kandari. Ajay is uh, operating partner at Sequoia Capital, uh, India and SEA. He served as group CTO at Gojek, and he has been part of the Gojek uh, from the very early days. He brings on the table the great perspective from a scaling uh, journey of uh, Gojek. Manjot works as product manager at Stripe. She was a product manager at Google earlier, responsible for product development and execution for uh, Kubernetes and Kubernetes engine networking. She brings uh, the scale, uh, the experience from uh, Google scale uh, onto the table. The third panelist is uh, Puneet uh, Kanduri, CEO of SN126, where he's building Isotope, a product that takes care of API regression testing. Previously, he led the development of ML infrastructure and AI services at Twitter. I think we have an amazing panel with great experience of building products for scale. I would like the session to be uh, informal. Please feel free to ask any questions that you may have by typing it in the chat window, uh, either in Zoom or YouTube. I'll review the questions and bring them to the panel at an appropriate time. Let's get started. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Ajay Manjot and uh, me for uh, joining. Thanks for having us, Anand. Let's start with actually, uh, yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, uh, there is something about products that you built at scale uh, from your past experience. Maybe we'll start with uh, Ajay. Hey, hey, thanks for welcoming me. Thanks for hosting me over here. It is great to be here. Um, so uh, I, I, what, I was at Gojek for five years and we have seen the crazy growth. And I was very fortunate to actually um, be part of the journey where we scaled from literally um, some 10,000 orders per day to like more than 5 million orders a day, which was great learning experience. Um, on top of it, uh, we kind of became the first super app of Southeast Asia where we had more than um, 17 products to offer. Uh, and we, if you go to Indonesia, you will have an amazing experience of whatever we do over there, we do everything possible. So we say, and we used to technically called our projects, uh, our products as go something. So like go car, go ride, go food. And then somebody started calling us like go everything. And that literally had, uh, that was literally a very amazing moment because um, when we used to say, if you want, like when I used to talk to people in India, I always used to say, if you want, um, like Paytm, make my trip, uh, Swiggy, Zomato, Uber, Ola, uh, and whatever you like think, like um, you can find it in one app. And on top of it, we send muscles to your home and we send cleaners to your home and we fix your car on the spot and we get you water as well. So it was, it was that, um, we kind of became lifestyle app uh, where you do not have to, uh, do not have to do the one things uh, which you have to go and do in multiple places. So we used to say it, we, we buy people time. And then we said, we, we bring people time. Uh, first it was buying time and then it's bringing time to your life. So that's what all about Gojek. And that's, that's it really good to talk about some lessons from that side. Uh, uh, thanks Ajay. Uh, let's see what uh, stories Manjot uh, has. Um, first of all, thank you so much for a organizing such amazing events and uh, having all of us panelists come together. Um, I will uh, talk a lot about one of the crazy scaling experiences that uh, I have fortunately been a part of in the past. Um, this was related to Kubernetes. And, uh, um, you know, the a time when uh, I joined the team. It was basically one of those uh, not super popular niche projects, which you know only very very uh, specific communities uh, in the open source world and uh, in technical infrastructure DevOps uh, would know about. So um, and we saw it grow from there to becoming a mass movement that it is today, where uh, we see like a massive change in not just how Kubernetes itself evolved uh, and the ecosystem built on top of it evolved, but just the nature of the whole, uh, you know, open source development and how people think about building developer tools, uh, companies, um, 
that uh, the that that whole change that happened uh, with I would say the Kubernetes movement. Um, I would love to uh, chat more about some of the experiences we saw over there. And uh, even within that, I mean, there's one aspect on you know just managing uh, scale with respect to the features that we needed to support, the uh, the absolute scale we needed to support in terms of traffic. There's also scaling in terms of teams. There's also scaling in terms of processes. Uh, and scaling in terms of tools that uh, I think uh, does not, maybe sometimes does not get as much attention as it should. Um, and I think those are things that truly make a difference uh, when you're going through those massive, uh, you know, growth periods of a product uh, and ecosystem. Uh, besides that, I've also been, uh, I've also tried to run uh, scribe.ml in the past, which was uh, my attempt at creating something from scratch. Uh, and like a whole different ball game compared to, you know, working at Google uh, in a really super large team uh, where things are, every single gear is moving at 100 miles per hour and you basically have to keep up with it uh, versus at a startup where you're basically working on every single thing and you're obviously keeping up with the community. But at the same time, you're making sure that, um, you know, first you um, get to a place where you can even think about scaling. So that journey, I think, is extremely different compared to uh, working at a, 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 you know, a product which basically has product market fit and is in the growth phase. Um, and I think the learnings on both ends uh, can really complete the picture in terms of how to think about scale and when to think about scale. Very interesting. Uh, 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 let's uh, now uh, see uh, what uh, Puneet has, what stories Puneet has. Sure. So, uh... Thanks, Anand. Uh, I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, my experience at Twitter and uh, you know the experience that we've had uh, building SN126 um, and uh, very different experiences, right? So, so at Twitter, I joined Twitter in 2013 as we were ramping up for an IPO, and uh, we had sort of these uh, sour memories from 2010 World Cup when uh, anytime like anybody would score a goal, uh, Twitter would go down. <laughs> And you would see the fail whale come up uh, because uh, suddenly everybody starts tweeting all at the same time. And you've got this spike that the infrastructure is just not able to handle. So literally, like we're talking about physical scale here, uh, and our systems weren't architected uh, well enough to, to be able to handle that. Right. We were a Ruby on Rails monolith uh, and uh, we had to go through the painful process of migrating into a Scala based uh, microservices architecture. And, uh, you know, in 2014, with every goal, uh, you know, regardless of who, you know, earned the goal, we felt like we were the ones winning because our infrastructure was not falling over. And to have gone through that journey with the company, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of churn it took uh, on the organization and, uh, you know, in the code base and, uh, you know, the conflicts among the engineers and whatnot, like, those are some of the stories that I am hoping to share uh, as part of this discussion. And then the second part is, you know, with SN126, uh, uh, you know, um, I made the naive mistake of thinking that, okay, we're starting small, so we don't have to think about scale at this point, right? But uh, being, uh, you know, uh, in the business of uh, monitoring, uh, you know, our uh, customers' infrastructure to understand all of their uh, key business scenarios that we're then going to use in our simulations, we had to monitor 100% of their traffic. So we had to match our customers' scale from day one. So even if we didn't have scale, the customers that we were going after had scale. And so our infrastructure had to match their scale. As a result, we ended up re-architecting uh, you know, um, our <laughs> uh, systems with, uh, like at least three times within the first six months. Uh, just so that we could like, you know, get to technical maturity with our, uh, you know, um, alpha customer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, those are some of the experiences that I hope to talk about as part of this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, thanks, Puneet. That sounds pretty interesting. So let's kind of uh, uh, start with actually uh, picking up uh, maybe one uh, use case and kind of talking about it, like uh, 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 something that one of the products that you built at scale. And... Uh, what the journey has been like. So we won't start with Ajay again. Oh, I thought it was a random round robin. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, early days, right? Uh, I think Ride was our, one of the biggest product, which was growing 5% uh, to 10% week on week. Um, and that growth is like explosive, right? Uh, once your traffic moves on. So it does not, does not sound a lot. Because it's like ten percent week on week is what like you have ten thousand next 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 day next week you will have eleven thousand, but the problem is that uh, the next week you will have like thirteen thousand and the following week will you will have like eighteen and then it will go to like twenty and then like four within four weeks you have double the traffic, 
uh, then within the four or uh, two more months you double the traffic again and then within the two quarters you have double the traffic again right so just to give you perspective uh, we had as i said we had like 10000 orders a day in june 2015 uh, by by december 2015 we were we were like 250000 orders a day um, and by march we had like half a million orders a day and that once you have that crazy thing um, we had to rewrite a lot um, we were on on we were also on rails and uh, what we chose is a strategy that our, all our oms will remain on rails uh, but uh, we will quickly move towards asynchronous microservices for performing the uh, critical functional jobs so let's talk about one functional jobs there are two functional jobs which which are very critical right uh, one is the when you get a live location from the drivers correct and our drivers exploded that point of time uh, till Till August 2015, we had around like 200, 350,000 drivers. By uh, no, we had like around 250 to 20,000 drivers, and by August, September, we had like half a million drivers. Um, then we had like one million drivers. If you have, if just to give you context of million drivers, what happens is like every driver is gonna send you a GPS ping every 10 seconds. So you get six six pings in 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 a minute. There are 14, 40 minutes in a in a day. And if you are getting six pings from million drivers, so you're getting around 6 million pings per minute. That goes around 8 billion events a, a day, right? Um, and if you look at 8 billion events a day, that's like crazy. We have to store and we have to update and we have to do many more things with those events. So that is one thing which we have to take out and uh, we do that. And because those pings are required because if we don't store those pings appropriately and don't bash them, then we can't allocate a nearest driver to you. So second problem which uh, we had to scale out was driver allocation problem. And uh, it started very simple when I, I was there, when our team first landed, we used to do a geo search on Redis uh, with Lua plugin, that won't scale. Uh, so we went to Mongo, which provided geo and that won't scale as well. And uh, we were new, we did not have any idea. So what came to us was a proper algorithms, right? And that's where the algorithms became super important. So we actually got into algorithms and geometry and how do we solve it? And we started using S2 libraries and creating tons and tons of workers and ephemeral workers and bringing, up, bringing them up and bringing them down. So we kind of wrote our allocation engine uh, like three times or four times within the first six months. Uh, and we kind of ended up writing our web app, and uh, not a web app, we kind of ended up writing our mobile app around three to four times. And what used to happen every day, uh, around three o'clock, systems will break. Because once you don't have driver, the customer will try again. So your concurrent request will go up really high. And the first thing we learned is that you need to do a amazing, amazing traffic throttling. Um, graceful, graceful traffic throttling for customers saying, please wait. And we are trying to find a driver for you, or please wait, there is, there's no more way we can give you a driver. Uh, so system don't go down because one system go down as soon as you bring it bring them up we are dealing with around 1.2 million concurrent connections from the from the drivers and around three to four million concurrent connections from the customers who are trying to get somewhere um, and that was the biggest learning we had that how do you do traffic shipping uh, drop the traffic as soon as possible don't let it go to application layer um, then authentication then authorization among microservices and all stuff but um, till till now I, our actual OMS are still in Rails. We still process those driver, those orders in Rails. Our functional things are in Clojure and uh, Go. And a lot of, we have massive, massive uh, message bus of Kafka. And when we were implementing Kafka, Kafka streams were not even out. And Kafka was like literally alpha, gRPC was really getting mature. Kubernetes was not on the scene. So those kind of things, we are trying to go on the latest technologies and still we don't, and we are only 50 of us. <laughs> so it was crazy. And um, so, so one of the things which we learned is that you need to, first, resilience is the first class system. Uh, spend a lot of time on resilience. Uh, second, asyn asynchronous is the biggest tool you can have. Um, use asynchronous as much as you can. Synchronous microservices are useless. They, are, they will still behave like monolith. And third, um, try, to, try to drop traffic as soon as you can figure out there's something wrong with it. Uh, not like proxy headers or parameters, whatever it is. So those are the first three learnings from the first six months. And we can talk about more learnings later, but that was the first thing which we learned in the first six months. 
thanks, Ajay. I think it's uh, it's very really interesting to see uh, how when you kind of scaling up as a uh, the org is kind of going through the massive uh, scaling path. Uh, it kind of I think it's I guess it feels more like a, a fight fighting every day, right? I mean, you have to kind of uh, it. Okay, I'll tell you what joke we used to have. So joke was that uh, this is there is river, and we have to take a boat from one one shore to another shore, and we all are like uh, what you say uh, di- we are diving we are wearing diving suits and oxygen, and we are, the boat is having a lot of um, what you say a lot of holes, and we plug our 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 fingers into that boat and just walk across the river every day, and so that uh, the, the boat does not sink, and we, our 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 fingers are all in. So it was literally like that. We all hands on the deck every day. <laughs> what is going down? Which database is failing? <laughs> we learned the value of that's what I'm saying. We learned the value of caching. We learned the value of and the thing is, if you can, we found a crazy market fit, right? We found a crazy product market fit. There is no way a lot of products go through this 10% week on week growth, and that was the blessing and dis, uh, blessing in disguise and curse as well. Because every day you have to go and tell business owners why did we go down today, and we again we will have, have same answers. And like, why can't you just put 100 more machines? And like, no, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you have to change the fundamental architecture. Like you can't carry, say, a big workload of truck using like 10 Murphy cars. You can't do that. <laughs> the cars will go down. So that's what it is, right? You can't you can't put 10 engines to make it something bigger. You can't. So yeah, the re-architecture was like on the fly. It was like changing the pistons of a running engine every day. Interesting. So let's kind of now look at actually... Uh... Uh, how does that look like uh, if you're working at scale already? You will know actually you're building for scale from the day one. Uh, but can you kind of uh, tell us like how uh, was it at Google building products at Google when you already know that Google scale is already there? So Anand, I was actually going to tell uh, another Kubernetes story, but listening to Ajay's answer on racial degradation, I remember a past life I had before I moved to the dark side of uh, product. Uh, I used to be SRE at Google and uh, we, and I'll tell a very fun story of, you know, how, and you'll see both how systems as well as people and organizations evolve simultaneously. Uh, so when I, when I just joined as a new SRE, uh, I was supposed to do, you know, something big known as, hey, you know, you're supposed to basically be responsible for all of Google photos and make sure it scales, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and do whatever it takes. Um, so one of the problems that I noticed was, you know, we used to have a lot of cascading failures. It's, it's actually, you know, at, at organizations of the scale of Google, uh, one failure like that, and that's like catastrophe in, in multiple systems potentially. So I'd seen one of those, uh, one of those failures. And uh, I came across this interesting uh, document from some other person in some other team. Uh, and uh, this particular document uh, spoke about uh, load shedding and the importance of shedding requests if a particular task is overloaded uh, when it receives that request or uh, that particular client is globally you know, uh, exceeding its limits and then uh, essentially abusing the system. So I, I then started to, you know, I decided to reach out to that person who was the author of this document and uh, turned out I, I, I earned myself an assignment to make it work for Google Photos. Um, and uh, so then started the journey of me, you know, adding small, small features here and there to this essentially a load sharing library that would, uh, you know, take a complex set of factors, RAM, memory, et cetera, individually on that task, that particular process in terms of number of concurrent requests it was handling, as well as uh, try to make a prediction. Um, and it would look at the global picture through some other external system to see if this particular client, uh, you know, and, and by client, I mean things like, you know, Gmail is sending me requests or, um, you know, photos is sending me, YouTube is sending me requests. Are they actually abusing uh, the system overall? And should I drop this request before sending it downstream, which is exactly what Az- Ajay was also referring to. So um, what turns out, as we kept on improving that particular library, uh, we, A, we ensured that it was generic enough and uh, B, we made sure that, you know, uh, as we keep on adding features, sometimes, you know, rand- I would get uh, pings by random teams. And at that time, we were four people and all four of us working in different teams, uh, completely different teams, just collaborating on this one interesting side project, which was essentially a side project for us. Uh, and so what happened was uh, we 
completed the first, you know, a, a couple of versions of that and actually use it in production. And uh, the thing about outages is, uh, you know, had, if people know when they're about to happen, they obviously make sure they prepare tons for it, but nobody knows when they're about to happen. And so one day uh, we had already the, the load sharing library uh, integrated into our uh, backend services. And uh, another outage uh, started happening where we suddenly had a flurry of, uh, you know, re-uploads uh, for the Android uh, Google Photos app. Uh, and that is when we saw the beauty of it. And that is when we actually saw how seamlessly, you know, despite uh, had, had this happened without those uh, particular uh, load sharing protections in place, it would have been catastrophe, not just for Google Photos, for downstream big table, uh, you know, other storage services. And the way these services work at Google, they're actually horizontal. So it's a shared service that, you know, Photos, YouTube, Gmail, all these services use. And uh, so uh, just the fact, the, the best part about being an SRE is nobody really notices you until something really bad happens. And then they say, okay, <laughs> this is how we're protected. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, that was a very uh, interesting, you know, uh, uh, thing to see uh, how we evolved from like one special use case of Google Photos to making sure that we kept the library generic enough. Uh, it essentially in, within Google, it had, uh, you know, uh, internal product market fit. All sorts of teams inside of Google started integrating their services with this library. And, and very soon we had around 300, 400 different Google Edge teams using it. Uh, what happened along the way was uh, people recognized, hey, this is like an amazing body of work and we should have these people working full-time on it. So that uh, ad hoc working group with a side project became an actual team. Um, and uh, not just that, what started off as a simple load shedding library became a set of four applications with four area leads. Uh, the first one was, as I mentioned, the actual core server throttler and load shedding library. Second was an asynchronous pub sub processing system so that you could offload batch processing. Third was uh, a, a caching system for RPCs. Uh, and the fourth one I'm actually forgetting, but I, if I remember, I, I definitely mentioned that. Um, so yeah, that was a very interesting journey of not just how you know systems scale, but also how teams and organizations scale along with them. Yeah, very interesting. So I have one question around that. Um, I mean, when you kind of, you said as an SRE, right? I mean, you said like uh, your presence gets felt only when something goes wrong, right? I mean, so now when you can build in this kind of libraries now at Google scale, I mean, how do you kind of test and actually make sure actually they're really working, right? Um, that's a great question. I mean, there are uh, there are obvious tests, right? Like like the uh, I mean, while you're while you're actually building these libraries, you make sure you do unit tests and things like that, which are obviously never enough. And that's why you know we have Puneet's awesome product, and I'm sure he he'll be he's be the right person to talk a whole lot more on that. And I'll make sure that <laughs> that he does. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's unit testing, there's integration testing. We uh, uh, for but for particularly for testing this load sharing library, we actually built an internal uh, you know, uh, load testing framework. So we designed a whole load testing framework and we would try out different types of, um, you know, uh, load and, and uh, different types of internal, uh, you know, replay of traffic. Um, even that was not enough to truly verify if this works or not. Again, these are all learnings, you know, exactly as Ajay mentioned, like one thing goes wrong, then you fix that. And one thing goes wrong, then you fix that. Um, so then we finally uh, also had, eventually we had this uh, teeing system uh, where we uh, sent a certain percentage of live production traffic to validate that particular load sharing library and whether it worked or not. Um, and this is where I think uh, Isotope today is doing a phenomenal job. Thanks so much for that plug, Majoth. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think I think quite interesting. I think we'll come back and actually look at uh, uh, a tooling uh, for scale a uh, little later. Uh, but I think let's move on to Puneet and say uh, let's see what story has to us. Yeah. So I mean, uh, uh, at Twitter we had like you know um, a lot of uh, innovations uh, following suit from Google. Uh, we hired a lot of people uh, from Google who came uh, over and then you know, uh, had the opportunity to build uh, these systems from scratch and then ended up open sourcing a lot of their work. So, you know, a bunch of observability tools, uh, uh, you know, came out uh, of uh, Twitter as, you know, their alumni started company, Wavefront being one of them. 
uh, and then you know uh, Matt Klein, for example, helped build TFE at Twitter, which was the front end, and then uh, he went on to work at Lyft and built Envoy, uh, which is like you know pretty phenomenal uh, today. Uh, you know, we I, I myself did some work on uh, an open source tool called Diffy, and then went on to you know build Isotope uh, at SN126. Uh, it, it, one of the stories that comes to mind uh, in, in relation to load shedding here specifically because it's been a hot topic today is, uh, you know, um, uh, a developer uh, had made a very subtle change to their code where uh, they were reading the same downstream value twice. So, you know, they were querying a data store and then, uh, you know, uh, they were supposed to reuse that value that they had read from the downstream data source in their code. But, they, you know, they made a small change in their Scala code, not realizing that, you know, the, 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 the identifier that they were using as a variable was actually a function call that was tied to an async, uh, you know, downstream call to a data store. So, you know, they, they just replaced that everywhere. And then they basically doubled the amount of uh, downstream calls reading the same thing over and over again, right? Uh, so this was, you know, one of those disasters that uh, would have happened, but actually didn't happen. And, uh, you know, uh, this was going, this code was going to be deployed on 10,000 machine cluster, right? So that 10,000 machine cluster that was sending like, you know, a million RPS down to the data store would have sub suddenly doubled, right? And the underlying data store was a multi-tenant data store. So when it got hammered with, you know, twice the traffic that it expects from its most expensive customer, right? Then uh, it would have gone down. And then subsequently, all of its upstream clients, not just the, the most expensive one that has the bug, right? Everything else would have fallen over as well. That would have caused a tier zero event at Twitter. Like the, the like nothing would be happening. Like the entire business would be down until that bug was resolved, right? So uh, the, this bug actually didn't happen. And the way it got caught was because of, uh, you know, the work that we did on uh, identifying in our simulations that uh, you know, uh, here's a disaster that is going to happen. If you deploy this code, you know these downstream calls are going to double. And because the developer was able to see these, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of uh, problems from uh, ever happening, uh, you know, uh, happening before they actually happened, they were able to, you know, make the fixes in their code and then, you know, get that uh, that out. So you know, the, it, it's uh, like a lot of these problems of scale, you don't have to worry about like with, you know, multi-tenant services and whatnot, you don't have to worry about when you're starting out small, but uh, at larger companies, you have to worry about things like quota and, uh, you know, um, having like, you know, reasonable load shedding mechanisms as definitely, you know, um, um, an, an alternative to, you know, having strict uh, quota requirements. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh... I mean, I think the common uh, thread here is like uh, there is sophisticated tooling that kind of has to be there to kind of build products for scale. Uh, I mean, Puneet, can you kind of also kind of mention like expand on uh, the tools that you mentioned, like what kind of tooling uh, that you use, for example, you mentioned that uh, you could caught the bird before it went into production, right? So yeah. what kind of tooling uh, was put in place uh, and maybe something about how Isotope can kind of help uh, in- Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. There. So, I mean, uh, that that's not the way things started out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the genesis of, of how we got there, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, 2014 is when we had like a really big disaster. It was Oscars night. And, uh, you know, uh, there's this fa famous selfie, uh, uh, you know, I wish I had it uh, up here uh, right now for you guys to see it. But uh, if you've seen it, you'll remember it. Uh, and Ellen DeGeneres, uh, you know, was about to take a selfie. And then uh, Bradley and Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and like all these celebrities kind of dogpile and photobomb the, the selfie. Uh, and then as soon as this selfie gets posted on Twitter by Ellen, it gets like 3.2 million retweets within uh, you know, a few hours, right? Uh, the story that most people don't know or, or don't remember is that you know, a few hours later, my team, I was part of the core services engineering team we deployed uh, uh, a code change to production to one of our core services, the Tweety, we called it the Tweety Pi service, uh, which is the, the tweet service, right? And this uh, particular code change uh, had a bug in it. And the bug was that, uh, you know, if you delete a tweet, uh, which is a retweet, then it uh, automatically deletes, uh, you know, uh, all the tweets that are connected to it. So uh, like if, if it is a retweet, it'll, con it'll delete the source tweet, right? So oh my God. <laughs> a chain reaction happened and all the 3.2 million <laughs> tweets disappeared. 
<laughs> and we were like you know uh, uh, you know covering our faces in shame and like you know this is a a, a, a big uh, you know um, egg on the face that we had so so while you know it's an iconic moment in twitter's history that you know um, the company as a business should be very proud of it's a humbling reminder of us as engineers that you know when we screw up uh, you know at scale <laughs> this is what what that screw up looks like uh, you know it took us a you know a while to figure out what had gone wrong and then you know fixing the data was a mess and then the business loss that had already happened was just you know something that could not be recovered but uh, you know uh, uh, that prompted the, the company to take a really hard look at you know what are we going to do to make sure this never ever happens again right and uh, you know they put together a study group of uh, people and i was part of that group i actually volunteered to be in that group i wanted to be a part of it uh, <laughs> and that's where you know uh, you know the the tool that i was talking about diffy uh, was born um, and so you know uh, fast forward uh, to you know um, a year later you know we we had already caught like a bunch of bugs and uh, you know the, the, there were like examples of uh, you, you know um, bugs like user login would have been broken right and it would have been broken in a very subtle way where you know if a new user is trying to log in uh, the way uh, it would break is that no matter which username you picked it would always give you the same error saying that this username is already taken so sorry twitter can't create a new account for you and user growth was extremely important at that time for twitter right like it it still is uh, and and that metric was being compromised as a result of this bug except you wouldn't find out until like you know weeks later that you know sign up is broken so that was the kind of bug that we automatically caught during this uh, diffy based simulation that uh, you know helped prevent this kind of disaster from happening and pretty soon you know the uh, whole company started using it we ended up funding it uh, i was asked to lead that group of people hire for it uh, we hired some for some of manjot's uh, friends from google uh, who who were excited about you know they're like hey you know this is cool uh, you know this is one of those things that we have kind of these kinds of things at google but this is you know a little bit better so it's like a it was good uh, it was a good pat on the back to get from you know google alumni as well who who joined our team uh, and then we ended up open sourcing it uh, it you know got picked up by airbnb mixpanel um, and and a whole bunch of uh, other companies um and you know um, we've been sort of building on top of that open source foundation with isotope uh, where you know we have sort of more advanced simulation capabilities uh, where you know we basically eliminate the need for there to exist um, in a staging environment we can basically instrument your production cluster to uh, automatically capture all the distinct business scenarios that uh, your code is going to experience and then bring those business scenarios and and by the way like it takes like weeks for some of the long tail business scenarios to even happen in production right so uh, we you know condense all of this traffic down to you know few thousands of uh, distinct scenarios that can then be run within a matter of minutes so you know with isotope simulations we're basically running a compressed version of like the last two weeks worth of traffic in two minutes and that tells you that hey you know this is everything that could happen to your code in production it has already happened and it, it's not broken so it's safe to deploy in production so that's sort of like the the thesis and premise behind uh, you know diffy and isotope and uh, you know what we've uh, you know done uh, to talk about another example this is in the isotope world you know I, with uh, sn126 uh, one of our clients is in uh, online marketplace and uh, uh you know they always have people trying to game the system with uh, expired coupon codes so you know two years ago if they were running a a, a campaign with 75% off then um, you know the people still trying to use that same 75% off coupon code today and the correct behavior of the the system is that it should be rejected right uh, because i'm not in the business of losing money to get customers right now i'm i'm in the business of uh, you know making more revenue um so so they uh, they they had a subtle bug in the code that would have started accepting these expired coupon codes instead of rejecting it right and uh, uh, what would have happened is that none of the observability tools would have been able to help them because you know um, when we talk about like scale we we think about uh, you know um, cpu we think about uh, you know memory we think about network all of these things would have been in, in uh, you know within margin and parameter like no instances of you know running out of disk no budget nobody is getting pager duty alerts and the way they they told us they would have found out what it is when uh, the finance guys ran the numbers and came back you know four weeks later and said how come you know the the transaction volume is up but the revenue is down and uh, and by that time they would have already lost like you know north of a million dollars a week right uh, so fortunately you know we were there to catch this bug for them and uh, and we prevented that that loss from happening 
and uh, you know that that's uh, that's uh, you know a quick quick o- overview and summary of you know how we uh, you know uh, create value for our customers and, and the kind of tools that are really required when you're operating at at scale not just in terms of uh, you know traffic volume but also scale in terms of the complexity of your business right uh, which is a which is a very different dimension right when when uh, you know the, as as Ajay was talking about his business I, was, I couldn't help but think that like when your app does so many things how do you keep track of you know everything making sure that release after release all the like you know thousands of things you have nothing is broken right like getting that comfort that getting that peace of mind with like the number of things that you're doing you know that just just goes up and and like when we look at even like simple microservices with our customers right we're, we're seeing that people have anywhere from you know uh, a few thousand to like tens of thousands of business scenarios per service right and 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 that's like just insane number of um, you know tests that people have to write nobody writes that many tests it's humanly impossible to do it and so that's uh, that's sort of you know uh, that sort of a different dimension of scale that that you know we 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 address with uh, with our tools yeah that's it's quite interesting uh, so i have a, a question here um, so when you say like you, you kind of replay the traffic and actually identify something is going wrong does it mean you have to kind of have a, a copy of the entire infrastructure running aside for running this uh so for us uh, we don't need a copy of the entire infrastructure what we do is we basically intelligently sample traffic from your live production systems right so uh, so we we basically sample the traffic and then we make sure that we're getting a very diverse sample set and we're constantly updating it in real time and that any time you want to run a simulation on a new version of your service a new version of your code uh that you know uh, latest uh, uh, you know um, sample set is available to you to run that simulation uh, so it's basically like very traffic focused um, uh, you don't need uh, to create expensive infrastructure because uh, for a unit of code that needs to be tested right we're automatically mocking all the dependencies let's say you know the service that you're trying to test has a dependency on uh, you know mysql database a mongodb instance and a bunch of other services uh that speak let's say grpc thrift or or http right uh, you don't have to deploy any of the underlying dependencies right what we are doing is automatically mocking the behavior of those services because we know how they behaved in production right so we intercept uh, you know any kind of outbound traffic that your service needs to create in order to you know uh, respond to the query uh, or respond to the request that uh, that it received from upstream and then uh, dynamically mock the behavior of uh, of these dependencies so Uh, we 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 basically reduce your uh, live uh, you know um, sim- uh, live traffic down to portable uh, tests that can run locally on a developer's laptop without deploying any expensive infrastructure right so you can just uh, you know uh, y- your server will start uh, locally just for your service without talking to anything in the outside world it will just uh, automatically you know sit inside this simulation where it thinks it's talking to a real database but actually it's not uh, because like everything is getting automatically mocked Very interesting. <laughs> I think I remember uh, Uber did something similar for actually uh, their uh, machine learning loads. They can actually uh, I don't remember what product it was, but uh, they open sourced. I think one of the Michelangelo. Like, no, I think it's not part of Michelangelo. It's something else. Sorry, I mean okay. I think I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, very interesting. I mean I think it uh, it feels like it's requires a quite sophisticated tooling to kind of. uh build products at scale i want to kind of get back to ajay and actually what we expand about more about um, the points you mentioned earlier about uh, uh doing async as much as possible and then uh, uh, drop traffic as soon as possible right i mean uh, uh, ajay can you kind of expand on that kind of a bit more and say like what does it really mean and then how you kind of did that okay so the thing is uh, you you should think um you should think about building a dams and think about internet traffic coming from one way and uh, w- once and you kind of throttle traffic at every like you say i'm going to le- i'm going to release only like 7000 cusec of water right that is your first trap um, so that is your first proxy you can put it in via traffic ship or whatever uh, ha proxy or whatever right um then integration or authorization proxy saying is this when a request came through but is this request valid itself like does it have proper authentication token somebody is trying to hack using somebody else's valid token as well those kind of things happen then you go towards saying okay does this does this data whatever is like is it read only data or read write data and then 
it is read only data does this exist in cache so you try to avoid going towards database so basically putting that thought process across and using app servers when your reach traffic reaches app servers it's only absolutely when it has supposed to do some processing so that is the first principle on the scaling on the first side right that is like bringing the traffic and dealing with the traffic second traffic the second thing is there are two thought process right uh, one is fire and forget and uh, fire and forget requires a lot of processing fire and forget is like something like this hey i want a driver and somebody says responds to you think okay i will get you a driver and i'll let you know when driver is found correct and then you go back to app saying okay we'll we'll wait for the driver to come and then somebody will go read the data for, and then you can increase the workers from the queue and read the data and figure out the driver is there or not once you find the driver and the reason you say uh, fire and forget once you say okay i got your request and i'll go to get your driver that means you close the connection because the thing is we are dealing with around 120 to 350 million requests per second uh, across our infrastructure right if you look at if you think about 120 million requests is like crazy right so you shut down your network traffic as soon as possible and you have to close the connection so you have to tweak some of the default cctl uh, configurations as well like what your network window is what your network timeout is all those stuff as well but then you go towards so you deal with cache it not doesn't so you have this workflow thing if this if this if this and eventually you go there and once you find the driver then what do you do now how do i let somebody know that i have a driver so you drop a message again and tell somebody go notify that customer so you send a silent push notification and the customer wakes up and or updates so you can do a pull based thing where you pull every 5 seconds or you can wait and wait for notification to come Uh, we have tried both uh, both have worked uh, both have different thought process like if you do pull based that means every then you have to make sure that you don't pull on your mobile side on on a, on the stroke of 5 seconds then you are, what you are doing is you are getting 1 million requests every 5 seconds because you are saying uh, 00050080 Uh, 0510015. So you are getting a million requests per five second just to pull the connection, right? Instead of that, you should randomize that as well and distribute it accordingly. Saying and somebody has to at the backend level need needs to keep uh, track of it. Saying you pull, you you um, pull me every third second, like th- three, thirteen, twenty-three. You pull me every fourth second, something like that. So that is one way. Second way, you can do PubNub or like you can GSM messages and all this stuff. so that is the second thing we did uh, so fire and forget is super important so everywhere you do something think about you're walking into this uh, a good analogy is you're walking into this fast food mcdonald's or burger king you go to a cashier say there's a, uh, there's a record and the cashier says okay please wait and then where somebody gets inside and on their screen prepare this prepare that and they bring that thing with a notification or with the receipt so you take the token there is token and you tell a guy who has order number 145 and here is your food so that is i'm extra simplifying it uh, but that's how it is that's how the architecture looks like almost everywhere um, and that's how it should be in most of the cases ajay yeah, i couldn't agree more with you can i can i jump in anand yeah, please, yes, please please yeah, i i couldn't agree more with you uh, like you know uh, with the, any kind of distributed system that that you want to build if you can do like an actor uh, based system like this with a message passing interface that's like obviously like the most efficient thing and if you could do at the protocol level you can go all the way down to udp and you know optimize packet sizes then like it, it, there's nothing more beautiful uh, than, than than that right like one of the problems that i ran into was like when you start look like uh, traffic wise like you know that's golden but when you look at it from the application layer perspective right uh, and you have now you've got a product that you need to build Uh, and you have to think in that distributed manner where the context uh, uh, is something that the application uh, like the 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 simple regular programmer has to figure out like how to manage that context right mm-hmm. which uh, like typical asynchronous uh, any kind of asynchronous library that you use that, that implicitly manages that context for you right uh if, if whether it's like through an underlying persistent connection that is being multiplexed across like you know tens of thousands of contexts or or however it's being done right like that message passing architecture itself uh, the the uh, the programming interface for the developer right that uh, ends up being uh, you know a, a fairly sophisticated task and it's hard to find programmers who can who can write code for those kinds of things right that's one of the reasons why um, you know systems like aka uh, you know didn't take off and erlang for for you know all the credit that has in the telecom all the success that has in the telcos you know didn't become so much mainstream 
Uh, so these message passing interfaces, while you know being extremely efficient at the sort of traffic level, right? You know, it's it's uh, there's yeah. like a trade off at the at the application level, right? It, they do, and and the thing is, when you when you deal with developers who come first time after like they have not dealt with it, and when your every API of your returns HTTP 200 OK or HTTP <laughs> 201, <laughs> and they get confused like, okay, I got this 200 OK and nothing else, and I got 201 and nothing else, I got zero as a response. <laughs> Like right. what is zero? Why it doesn't give me one or two or something else? It, it gives me the thing and, and the response is just zero. I'm like, yeah, but because this, the request you have done is succeeded and they'll call you back. I'm like, they call back who? <laughs> the, <laughs> and like, then you go, they'll call back your webhook, which you have registered with the microservice if you are within the service. And if it is not webhook then, and then they will actually, if whatever token you have passed, they will call back that mobile mobile phone token or mobile phone token, and they will get it. And putting your putting your head around it. So what I used to do, I used to actually give this McDonald's example or Burger King example, saying this is what it is. You are one of the actors, and you are supposed to do this. He's like, then I am not getting the full picture. And I go, you can get the full picture as soon as you move from the kitchen and go towards order, and you can see what is happening. So you should you should switch between the, these two roles. If you don't switch, if you don't work on front end, and if you don't work on back end, uh, and you don't switch roles, it is super confusing. So yeah, yeah right. that that happens, and it's, it's 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 very efficient. But then you need to have a very different thought process, the very different paradigm shift in terms of um, how do you write programs and how do you uh, write uh, overall service itself. Like a lot of times, people write microservices. It's actually not a microservice; it's like whole monolith. And then I used to a little bit get angry saying, look, dude, can you rewrite this in like two weeks? What do you mean? He's like, no, it's going to take months. And then it's not a microservice. Um, it should be, it should be, you should be able to manage it. You should be able to discard it. You should be able to like, don't have any love for it and be, Im implement it better. And if you can't do all that stuff, then it's not a microservice. You're writing monolith, except if you are writing monolith, then don't do asynchronous as well. Then try to increase the performance on the throughput. And we, we, we are okay with that. <laughs> Yeah, I guess uh, distributed monoliths. Oh yeah, distributed monoliths used to happen a lot. It happens everywhere actually. One of the basic, um, one of the basic things which I have seen, they will have monolith, and then the, what they'll do, they'll make ten copies of that monolith. We have put behind a load balancer, and they start calling it microservice. It is actually it is not, uh, and it kind of uh, and because they forget that they can increase the app servers as many as much they want. Um, so, database is not going to go anywhere. So you have to think very differently. They all microservices should share their own databases as well. You can't share database among microservices, and that's like again crazy thing. The, the, the way I saw this, uh, you know, happen at Twitter, uh, the kind of microservice architecture we had at Twitter was uh, was one where we, you know, uh, saw the uh, like if you look at a monolith, right? It's basically a call stack, right? Any request can be perceived as a call stack, right? Uh, functions calling other functions. And yep. the thing that Twitter did was that, you know, uh, we wrote a library that made these function calls asynchronous and that kind of led to layers of division. So you take like a chunk out and that it becomes your microservice. Uh, and uh, so that the, what used to be a shared library called uh, birdhouse or if I name uh, or some bird cage or like so, there were a lot of bird names at Twitter, which is like another <laughs> thing that was wrong with Twitter, <laughs> but yeah. everything was a bird name. And uh, like people didn't know what, what, what was like my service was called gizmo duck. And people like, what the hell does Gizmo Duck do? It was yeah, the user exactly. service. And then people would ask me, why isn't it just called user service? Well, you know, the people who <laughs> originally named the service. Anyway, that's a, that's a detour from what I wanted to say. But, uh, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, you can take a, a monolith uh, apart and look at like the layers of functions that are being called and then make those function calls themselves asynchronous. And then, you know, that give, give you that, get you that uh, network separation. So now you're calling, you know, across one server and another. Uh, which, uh, you know, uh, then uh, if you try to optimize that, right, that led us down the path of, uh, you know, uh, multiplexing. So what, uh, and like uh, client side load balancing. And so you get rid of the load balancer in between. You have service discovery where you, uh, your client library will automatically discover all the servers that belong to the cluster that it needs to target in that namespace. And then it'll basically round robin between them, right? And uh, it'll basically have like a pool of persistent connections with some of them. And uh, on that pool of persistent connections, whenever you have calls, it'll multiplex on those, part, uh, you know, uh, those calls. So like the protocol stack uh, got a little bit more complex. So this was like the whole finagle library that, that Twitter built and, and shipped out. 
and uh, you know with the as much optimization right like this was all the work that went into sort of uh, trying to maintain that uh, procedural programming uh, you know paradigm that uh, developers are so familiar with that you know function a calls function b which calls function c uh, and developers are used to thinking in that paradigm whereas you know if you remove the top half and bottom half right that okay you've done it and you're you know for, it's fire and forget and then when they call back that path is completely up to you so figure out like how you're going to deal with that call back and uh, you know how you're going to retrieve that context by yourself it, that that's a very different paradigm which uh, you know uh, uh, at least at twitter i didn't see people having the courage to <laughs> to to go down the path of uh, so uh, you know i i want to commend ajay for <laughs> for having achieved that uh, you know uh, and and uh, i i wish uh, you know i had uh, the opportunity to see some of that code uh, that's that's yeah, really inspiring thing, yeah the thing is we 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 did not do it just by that we kind of learned very hard way first thing but i want to go back to one point which you made and i think it was very important point the naming the services right while it is not in the scale but at least part of the scale uh, because we had in early days we had a stan marsh and ls and wonderland and what not right so we used to call our primary production environment sometimes wonderland because ls was a service which will allocate the drivers so allocation service which ls and it is in wonderland and like people like new people will get all the time confused what is stand marsh what is ls what is this what is that and then um, after like and that we killed it very very early on saying okay we going to call user service user service com service com service food service food service uh, while you want to call waiter as a oms for this what we'll call oms so we can put in bracket your lovely service name but we'll call it food oms it's not waiter um or like search service or whatever right so we had like all and every team have they love naming we love naming humans love naming <laughs> right but sometimes what happens once you look at 800 services with yeah. the various names you lose the context what the hell is happening uh, correct because we had 17 products each product like largest was uh, food and transport and like payments and they had like a lot of services uh, so given that we kind of got the naming right so my request to everybody who is listening one of the things which you should always do uh call the service what it does not what you like it to mean it so that's so very this is point. one of the apps absolutely agree on that so in order to uh, uh, we actually saw similar uh, you know uh, setup as what puneet described which is uh, internally inside we uh, we had a framework and and that's where the load sharing library also uh, uh, fit in uh, we basically had this framework that took away the task of ensuring that all calls are asynchronous uh, everything uh, there's client side load sharing there's client side throttling um, um, you know all those things were basically taken away as uh, uh, responsibilities of the framework rather than responsibilities of every single individual business team in order to ensure that they make progress as soon as possible and uh, eventually we developed like a whole um, uh, sre platform on top of it and one of the tasks was exactly that uh, automatically generating names on the basis of <laughs> configured graph nodes so uh, uh, to give you some sense i mean uh, like every single product uh, on on uh, earth google photos was a gigantic monolith for the longest time until we started breaking down into microservices and at some point that one uh, gigantic monolith was broken down into at least 100 uh, services that uh, microservices and, and it was still a monolith despite breaking <laughs> breaking out 100 different microservices um, you know and and uh, we had to take care of not only you know a just as sres when you're uh, debugging a service you just have to know what exactly is happening um, in that particular uh, binary uh, and also be able to trace down who's responsible who's not responsible so that sre platform was actually a very beautiful uh, very beautiful one that took away a whole lot of um guess work around a what the service is doing b which team is responsible uh c you know what type of like core function that this is supposed to serve and most importantly the the mission of that platform was day zero onboarding by sres so uh, till date i mean in the past uh so in the past what was happening was uh, every single time we had to onboard a new service there was a whole uh, two four months long procedure where we would have like a checklist of you know n number of things that were done but with if if a service was built using this particular framework um that made uh, the promise was we'll onboard your service in a, on the same day that you're ready to put it in production um so that really changed the game around you know just managing because the other sort of uh, you know tools and features we built around it was for example releases 
uh, which is a very critical part and automatically releasing services on a daily basis so yeah fun fun times <laughs> I, mean, I think it brings like two uh, broad themes, right? I mean, something I want to touch upon. One is developer productivity when you kind of work with such a complex uh, uh, systems and uh, the failure modes in such complex systems, how to deal with Okay, But before kind of getting to that, I want to kind of contrast uh, building products at scale in a large organizations with actually building products at a small, at a, at a startup. And how is the process different? Okay. And maybe like what's the right time uh, to think about scale? I think uh, Kunit mentioned about his experience, but uh, I'm sure uh, there may be conflicting opinions. I want to kind of uh, hear from all of you uh, about like, what does it feel to kind of build products, uh, build products at a, when you don't have scale or you're anticipating scale at a later point in time. So how do you kind of build and how you start approaching building products or like any of these lessons apply there or do you have to kind of think differently? Um. I, I have a very strong opinion on this. Um, maybe I just have an opinion and you can call, qualify it being strong. <laughs> so uh, I think um, when you start, uh, always start with monolith, always start with MVC, always start with the model uh, uh, template view kind of uh, way, whatever it is, right? Um, you will be surprised that monoliths can actually go on for very, very long time. Uh, like, like when when Puneet did uh, rails removed rails or moved away from rails to something else, um, Scala or Erlang, you might have seen that they are already at very large scale. A lot of time people say that rails does not scale or Django does not scale. I don't believe that. First thing is that. Um, second thing, our our two popular RDMS, which is like MySQL and uh, Postgres, are very resilient and very good in many many things the time you hit like a, a lot of records into it. So you don't have to use anything fancy uh, for, for up to like 100,000 or even up to half a million order a day. You don't have to do anything fancy. The, that is what it is. The only thing you might want to put is a caching server in between or cache, caches in between and a good load balancer. Uh, understand load balancers very well. Um, if you get to start getting more and more requests, uh, then the first thing would be structure your API so they can you can redirect, read, write requests to different clusters. If there are read clusters, there are write clusters, and things will just change because what happens a lot of products you'll see around 60 to 80 percent data is read data or more. Like in Twitter, a lot of data will be read data. Wikipedia, a lot of data is read data. Read write data is very less, right, compared to consumption. And that is true for almost every product. Like you look at the e-commerce site, you look at anything. Um, you are browsing a lot, then you are making order. You are making order like once a week, but you are browsing almost for four days. So read, write situation. So those are two, three things. We, we can go in more details. I would say simple load balancer, understand your load balancer, use NY, HA proxy, whatever you want to use it. Uh, have a very nice proxy, which is like a, a HD proxy, like Nginx or something, which is standard. Uh, use a cache, use Redis, use your Django or MySQL or Rails or whatever and just use your database and you're good. And if you serve good APIs, then you can use any front end from framework. It will just work beautifully for longest period of time. That's my one advice. I completely agree. I would like to add one more thing. I think adding data partitioning, uh, thinking about data partitioning would probably be uh, another good weapon that can kind of take you uh, quite uh, even longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can. Uh, if you go really crazy, then yeah, data partitioning is there. So you can do that. Then you put user, user registry and do a data partitioning. You are perfectly fine as well. I mean, a lot of times, like data, when data is time series, you just kind of partition by the date or month or something. And then yeah. pretty Long much. Rotation, data rotation, archival, all that stuff will start. You will start learning that. But my point is just, just to start with, you half a million order, you don't have to do any of this stuff for a longest period of time. Just increase disk. And Postgres and RDB, Apple and MySQL are amazing. They're really, really amazing databases. Great. Uh, uh, thanks, Ajay. I mean, I think let's kind of see, uh, uh, Manju, do you want to kind of talk about uh, your experience of or uh, building like from a startup or building when you don't really have scale? Like what do you kind of, uh, how do you approach it? So um, I would also advocate for starting with a monolith until you're absolutely sure you have uh, you know, product market fit and uh, you are then experiencing scale and then you start hitting those problems. Um, we, uh, so our, the product that we were building, scribe.ml, 
it was essentially uh, an experiment tracker for data scientists so imagine you're basically writing your uh, your uh, notebook right and then uh, you want to make sure as a data scientist uh, and as a data science team overall that um, your all your artifacts what are artifacts artifacts are your data set your features your models your uh, your metrics um, and your graphs your plots etc all of those things are tracked in a in a you know in a meaningful way in one place and shareable with your team uh some of these things uh we i mean my team uh, experienced as data scientists themselves um and uh being able to track those things seamlessly uh can help your team become a lot more productive so that was the problem statement and our architecture was there was a client side uh, so there was literally a package a python package we would provide that you would import in your in your notebook server and that would uh, send some some of this data across to our uh, our backend and then uh, have, we had a dashboard that would display all of that's a very very simple uh, you know architecture and application and uh, we were also we were using postgres um, uh, and so no problem with respect to uh, we reached the scale of a couple of customers and we were in just in pilot phase so not gigantic amounts of scale uh, that said we were already uploading you know if you have a team of 30 data scientists there are so many models and you know runs and experiment runs that you are already uploading on a daily basis so uh, we didn't hit any scaling problems on the back end or the front end services um, or the, or the client library for that matter concerned uh, so i would also completely advocate for going for a monolith when you're beginning uh, uh, when you're just beginning building your product and you're still figuring out product market fit the, the interesting um, dimension of scaling we hit was um, how do we display all of this information to the user so the scaling problem we were solving uh, initially was uh, now that you know our our backend is processing so many models uh, on on a da- on a daily basis even displaying all of that uh, you know amount of information to a user is an interesting uh, problem uh, to solve for but it definitely doesn't have any anything to do with uh, scaling our backend infrastructure and being able to handle that that load uh great so i think uh, i think we're kind of uh, uh running out of time so what i would like to do is like i want to kind of pick one more uh topic uh and uh, also there's some questions so coming up okay so we'll close at uh, 7:45 so uh, before uh, we kind of get on to questions i want to kind of uh uh i think uh, here uh, punit's uh, take on building uh uh sure beginning yeah yeah so uh, i uh, i agree with the other two panelists here that uh, monolith is the way to go uh, with the exception of you know our current startup uh, i because uh, in previous lives uh, even at twitter when i was working on a stealth project where we were asked to like go build a new app from scratch uh, that is going to help us get the next 70 million users out of india we went with the monolith and there are a lot of advantages to uh, you know a monolith and i want to look at this from uh, you know the the development speed perspective right like in early days the only thing that matters is agility right the only thing you've got going for yourself is speed and you cannot give that up right like you come if if you're you know uh, trying to move fast towards an opportunity if you're competing with a bigger guy uh, or anything like that right like the only thing you've got is your agility and focus right so uh, the monolith is is by far the best thing you can do to yourself in terms of agility because like if something goes wrong like you can trace through the entire stack stack trace like all your code is in one place you can make changes you can deploy very very quickly uh, so all of those assi- uh, efficiencies are working for you uh, and uh, you know um, uh, like never do any kind of distributed architecture because it's cool like uh, there's a lot of uh, tool seduction that happens with engineers it's like you know all the big guys are doing microservices i should start like a 0 billion dollar company and also do microservices that's that's really not uh, you know the way uh, to think about it uh, do it when you have to when you have a good reason to even in our case like when i talked about sn126 we started with a monolith right we knew that that was the fastest way to get and uh, you know when i say that you know we ended up rearchitecting ourselves within the first 6 months that was because we Uh, like we stuck with the monolith for as long as we could right we we diluted down the product requirements that would fit inside a monolith right whether it meant right like you know not looking at all the traffic so we're basically dropping the quality of coverage that we are giving to our customers or whatever right because we did not want to give up that agility until we found paying customers right it was only after we found customers who were willing to give us real money that we said okay now we have to deliver quality and for that we are going to have to you know um, in our particular business uh, we were required to 
you know, uh, do microservices and, and distributed systems, right? Um, like that, that basically, you know, meant that we now had to take a hit on, uh, you know, how efficiently we can debug our systems, um, how quickly we can, you know, um, iterate on things and, and whatnot. Um, but, you know, we, we got used to all of those things, uh, you know, soon after. So again, you know, uh, I agree with the other panelists and, and you know, uh, recommend Monolith as a, uh, you know, the only place to start to anyone who's looking to start uh, a new business. Yeah, so I guess that uh, brings to my other question, like, uh, like you said, like the developer agility is what kind of supports when you kind of go to a distributed architecture or building for scale. Now, I want to kind of turn it around and ask, like, what do you do to kind of make sure that uh, local productivity won't uh, hit? because you are building for scale. So what kind of techniques or tools or uh, processes you follow to make sure that developers continue to be productive even when you're building for scale? Yeah, who want to uh, take it? Yeah, I want one of the other panelists to, to start with this one because I'm gonna, if I start ranting about this one, I'm not gonna stop. So I want the okay. uh, other, other panelists to take this one. I, I, this, is, this is too, uh, too 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 greedy for me to to take this one, okay please. so uh, in my view the way we worked it out was uh, i wrote a book uh, i have not a book i wrote a blog post about it which says uh, checklist uh, to to save the like i, I call it software infant mortality rates <laughs> basically whenever you deploy it breaks things right and we don't know what happened um, so what we did we kind of created a checklist saying these are the things you should check before you're deploying that is too far in um Second thing, we actually aggressively monitored business metrics. Um, so what happens with business metrics, suppose your, business, you, your network infrastructure will say everything is fantastic and fine, and you see your orders going down. Now, how do you know where is the problem? But one thing is very fundamental. If the traffic was there yesterday and the same traffic is there today, why the traffic is slow? Why we are processing less order? And when you go a little bit dig, dig deeper down, you will figure out some service has gone slow. And that is the weakest link. Uh, like we are not able to, so you have to, whether you have auto scaling and all stuff, suppose your user profile service, which is, which is even auto scale, but it's going, your database is hitting IOPS, which might be possible. And then it gets slow. So those kind of things. Uh, so first is checklist, implement as many checklists as you can uh, for everything. I'll give you simple, simple, simplest example saying, um, one of the rule was don't delete the column. And if you're adding the column, Tell us why you are adding this column. Are you putting the index? If you are putting the index, what is the default value? If it's default value, are you putting in the cache? If you are putting in the cache, when are you going to deploy this? And how many call, how many rows that table already has? Suppose you do, did a migration, added a column to a table which has like 300 million rows, then nothing is going to move for next one and a half hours because the database is just going to adding the column to all the, without no default values and going to run index on top of it. So create a checklist. I think checklist is very good for everything. Uh, create templates, uh, monitor your business metrics. And these are not very fancy things. Uh, I do not want to get a tool set and like rank, which Puneet is going to do, because then there are a lot of things you can, uh, we can talk about a lot of, like we can talk about like hours on this. I can tell you that. But those are the three things which I found anywhere where people are just getting into it. But because later the tracing comes and logging comes and then a lot of other things come, which actually can give you more and more signals. What you're looking for a beacon or signal in this whole thing, finding a fault in a distributed architecture is like finding a needle in haystack. So start with these three things and that will give you kind of basic things and then you'll learn over a period of time and go read books, go read their amazing books about it, which books are nothing but uh, failures of other people or experiences of other people or successes of other people. And you should just not do that again. So please read books, read a lot of books. Thanks, Ajay. I think uh, we'll come back to recommendations about what to read, et cetera, once we finish this. Uh, so what to uh, take up next? You, I actually want... have one last comment. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not going to answer that question because I, I yeah. think, again, this is like one of those topics where all of us can <laughs> go on for hours. So this is actually a cliffhanger for Anand and uh, content for the next talk. Um, I actually have a question, which is, uh, how do you measure developer productivity? Uh, I think that in itself is a very interesting problem that I have been thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things to measure developer productivity, uh, you can't measure it very well, but one of the things to measure a uh, symptom of developer productivity is that figure out how much time, uh, we have to be disciplined, but figure out how much time we are, we are spending on uh, bug fixes and production uh, upkeep 
first thing is that that is one thing which will kind of gives you where your systems are and second thing which we did through the product management is that we logged every bug uh, where the story belongs we started looking at which which team produces most number of bugs not trying to blame developers please don't react like that but the thing is there are getting multiple problems of uh, the analysts are not writing proper stories and acceptance criteria uh, the specs are not done very well unit testing is not done very well so there are multiple areas uh, where the bugs are being originated and try to fix those problems but uh, there is no fixed way of developing the uh, measuring developer productivity but these are the things which can improve it while you can't say it is 1 or 1.5 but uh, you know that you can whatever whatever baseline it is these things will improve it much much better and then spend a lot of time in platform engineering and platform tooling which allows developers to do repetitive tasks in a much more automated way okay i i just want to add to that that you know um, slightly different perspective uh, i feel that uh, you know um, a lot of the problems that we see we, there's like a plethora of tooling and i think it's it's a good idea not to not to drive into that at this point in this discussion but uh, uh, you know when when you use that plethora of tooling at uh, at larger companies right like often it leads to uh, a realization uh, that you know there's a lot of problems so you know distributed uh, tracing for example will give you insights into the fact that you know when when a request hits twitter it pinballs across you know 30 40 different services uh and and the the question that comes to mind why why is this pinballing across 30 40 different services is it actually required is there redundancy in the architecture and uh, you know at one point i i came to the realization that you know we had uh, more than 450 microservices at the company and no single person in the organization had a clue as to what the bigger picture looked like and that was uh, you know a terribly um, scary thought because uh, you know i i found instances where you know there was uh, the same uh, logic the same business logic had been written three different times by three different people right uh, how do you make sure that uh, there's no redundancy being built uh, because ultimately the system that that you have is a reflection of the organization that you have right so uh, distributed systems isn't uh, so much a a code or, or or engineering problem it's it's more of an organization problem right like uh, how do you organize people in a way that you don't lose that central leadership uh, because you know uh, and and this this uh, you know uh, goes a little bit into the people side of thing also right like because uh, as you look at the leadership hierarchies right like the higher up you go uh these are like increasingly people focused roles right you are you are uh, you know you have engineering managers who are sort of people managers right and then their uh, leaders are senior engineering managers and then directors and then vp of engineering and and so forth right uh, uh, the cto is a is a role that is like supposed to be super technical but then the cto does not have a hierarchy of tech leads that uh, you know rolls up the just the technical aspect of the organization right so so when you have like people leaders leading the organization uh it often leads to these uh, kinds of uh, situations where uh, the distributed system architecture becomes so incredibly complex that you know your productivity starts uh, you know losing and you end up having a lot of overhead in terms of communication that uh, you know just to understand like how to use this product and or, or how to use this service and how to get this product feature done you have to you know schedule 10 meetings with like you know uh, five different stakeholders and then you have to do like a multi quarter planning exercise and and what not right like that's not the kind of agility startups are used to right like it's like if i have an idea now i should be able to have it in production within a week and within two weeks i should be able to kill it because it's not working right whereas you know the, with with the larger size organizations you kind of lose that agility uh, at least like that's what i felt um love to hear comments from the other panelists on along these lines yeah i think i would say the converse law right i mean yeah i think we're almost uh, i think we're just past the time i think uh, uh, let me take some of the questions from the panelists and then we'll we'll uh, quickly uh, uh, close it okay so one question that we have here is uh, uh, we talk a lot about uh, scaling back and services at scale but when how is it in the front end so this is a question from peter thomas So people talk about micro front ends, etc. Like anyone want to kind of have a comment on scaling front end in terms of microservices like architecture? Um, we kind of uh, so basically what we kind of did is uh, see software design uh, designed by abstraction is the best. Uh, so even you look at uh, microservices, we are we are designing by abstraction. So whether you call it micro front end or whether you call it mono repo. Uh, as long as you put abstraction over there so what we did we created created a 
uh, UI, 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 uh, and UI platform, UI engine, and people which will provide components so people, people can build, use those components to build the front end services, right? And that kind of gave us a freedom of two things. One, uh, the people who are at network or device level, they can focus on that. People who are at platform level, they can focus on designing UI comp components so that UI will look, in, uh, look very similar on the Android and iOS both. Uh, we had our own uh, UI framework. And then you, on top of it, you reuse those components. So you have similar experience for user because we are, use, we are doing a lot of similar things. We also develop our own design language. This is only for scale. Uh, it is not for uh, uh, in early days. If you're doing early days MVP, please choose either to go native or use React Native or use Flutter, whatever you are comfortable with. But once you go towards it, um, uh, design by abstraction is, abstraction is one of the principles you should apply everywhere. And that kind of gets you a productivity and a speed both and gives you kind of a interlocking, interlocking um, uh, not, not, not mutually exclusive and uh, what is called MISI, right? MISI uh, and cumulatively exhaustive kind of thought process. And you don't have a lot of conflicts in the source code. You don't have a lot of merge conflicts in anywhere else. And people can still work independently. And that's what this kind of becomes micro front ends if you give the only component based UI development for people. Very interesting. I, mean, I think we can go on talking about uh, the stories forever, uh, but I think it's kind of uh, end of the time. I want to kind of uh, stop with one last question. Okay. So Vishal Ram is asking uh, any good uh, recommendations to learn uh, scaling systems or even teams. So uh, SRE we... book from Google. Please read those both two books. They are available and they are free of cost. That's where we start. Yeah. Anything else? Um, Software Design mm -hmm. Philosophy by John Esterhout. That is a very good book. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can you kind of type it in the chat uh, if you don't mind so that people can actually I will just search and you design okay. of software software design philosophy. Yeah, and I, I think I'll coordinate with you and actually post it on the yeah. Uh, yeah. Asgeek page so everyone gets it. Okay. Great. Uh, anyone else want to kind of add uh, more references? I, mean, I think uh, multiple different books for different, uh, uh, you know, things. And I, I would say the uh, there's still a lot of, if, if people are still thinking of uh, writing in depth about pieces, there's a lot of white space for scaling machine learning architectures. Uh, and I haven't been able to find that perfect book. <laughs> so that would be an interesting one. Great. So I think we have, uh, uh, I mean, amazing discussion. And uh, I'm sure you can go on for uh, hours kind of, uh, talking about uh, uh, interesting success stories and also the failure stories and what worked, what did work. I think these are all failures. If you notice, these are all failures. <laughs> None of them is success. Success came afterwards. So basically, you messed up and then you fixed it. And we are telling you how we fixed it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think that is the best answer to the question Ajay just gave uh, indirectly. Like the best way to learn is to fail. So just, you know, uh, fail uh, at large scale companies and that's the best way to learn about <laughs> how to scale. Yeah. And, then, and then come back and build a startup. Right? Yeah, nothing nothing yeah. teaches you more than battle scars. Yeah, yeah. and and, and uh, one of the things which happens is in today's world, um, uh, like iterative development and failing iteratively is much, much better than trying to go towards a perfect product. It's okay to ship the product with bugs and fix it later on. Uh, but there is no there is no silver bullet. There's one more paper by uh, uh, Frederick Books, I think so. It's no yeah. silver bullet written in like 1970s. Um, yeah. That's what it is. So fail by creative development as much and as fast as you can. Rather you fail in first week than fail in like 12th week.